I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. I had a wonderful Halloween, did you? Oh, yes, I had a wonderful Halloween. Were you scared? No, were you? Only when I fell out of the tree. What tree? Oh, a witch came along and picked me up and took me along on her broom and set me in the top of a tree. And I fell out of the tree. Oh, oh, that's not true. Yes, it is. Oh, it is not, because there are no witches. <laughs> I give up. There's no <laughs> use trying to fool you. You're right. There are no witches and there are no ghosts. They're just funny old pumpkin heads that make funny faces when you put candles in them. <laughs> yes, but it's lots of fun. Uh, it certainly is. <laughs> and so are the funnies. Will you read them to me? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Sticks guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy, with the cavalry, was taking Black John, the vicious mountaineer, back to Denver to stand trial when they were attacked by Indians. They made their way to the stage station and there are putting up a defense within the cabin. They know such a small group can't get through the hill safely, so Hoppy has slipped away to bring help. As the Major looks out the window, first picture, he says, uh, The massacred defenders we found at this stage station are bitter evidence that Chief Ironclaw's renegades are staked out on these hills. California says, Well, I hope Hoppy shows up with help soon. Last picture, top row, Black John says to the Major, Hey, how about freeing my hands and allowing me to smoke? I'm not fool enough to attempt to break with engines around. Oh, I suppose not. But I don't light the match near window. It'll give away our presence. Black John's hands are free. First picture next row, Black John lights a cigarette. Leans against a wall beneath the window. The troopers turn their back on him. After a few puffs, Black John watches his chance. When no one is watching... Last picture, second row. He flips a cigarette out the window into a stack of dry hay, which instantly catches on fire. <laughs> From a distant hilltop, first picture, bottom row, an Indian scout sights the beacon light burning outside the cabin. He mounts his horse and rides swiftly to the Indian camp, a short distance away in the valley, where he spreads the news. Last picture, warriors mounted on their ponies ride into the clearing around the cabin toward the troopers who are trying to beat out the fire outside the cabin. Oh, if they don't get the fire out, that cabin might catch fire and burn down. Yes, it might. And also, the Indians can shoot the troopers who are in the light of the campfire. Yes, that's a possibility, too. My, I wonder where Hoppy is, whether he's safe or not. Well, we'll have to find that out next week. Now? Oh, let's go over the page, and I'll bet you that we'll find Prince Valiant there on page three. Why, look, here he is on page three. <laughs> See? And remember that Prince Valiant has come back home after being away for over a year, and he found that his wife, Alita, had two twin babies, brand new ones. That's right. And little Prince Arn was very sad because no one paid any attention to him. But remember, I said that just as soon as Val saw Prince Arn, who was his little boy, that Val would be nice to him. And it happened just like I said, you remember? Yes, I remember. Val gave Prince Arn a helmet that fell down over his ears, a shield and a sword, and Arn looks just like a little knight. <laughs> yes. I wonder what's going to happen next. Well, let's read now and find out. See, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Little Arn feels like a man in his new helmet and shield and sword. And today he follows wherever his daddy, Prince Valiant, goes. He goes with Val out into the barn to inspect the horses. And little Prince Arn, still wearing his helmet, decides to pick out a horse for himself. For someday, he's going to be a knight. 
and he walks right under the hind legs of a horse, not knowing that horses sometimes kick even little boys. Second picture, Val reaches down with a horrified look and grabs a little arm out of harm's way. Last picture top row, they go out of the castle to the river to see if the salmon are running. This is the first time that Prince Arn has been out of the castle. And as he crosses the moat, he bends way over to look below into the river and nearly topples into the moat. As they near the river, he sees hundreds of flowers in the field. Little Prince Arn, carrying a sword and shield, pretends that the flowers are a horde of Danes with golden helmets. And brandishing his sword, he cuts a path through the flowers, thinking to himself that he is slaying hundreds and hundreds of enemy soldiers. When they reach the river, his shield slips off his arm and clatters down the cliff. So little Arn climbs down the cliff to get it. By now, Prince Val is nowhere in sight. Some people across the river see the tiny boy climbing down the steep cliff and wave to him to stay where he is for fear he'll be killed. But little Arn can't hear them because of the roaring river waters. He finds his shield and climbs back up. And then he starts for home. Last picture, second row. But now he finds himself in grass taller than his head. And he can't see where he's going. The castle wasn't where he left it. But he can hear people in the distance calling his name. Time passes, and poor little Arn becomes hungry. First picture, bottom row, he meets a wolf that looks hungry too. The wolf growls. <coughs> little Arn stands still, sword in hand, facing this terrible enemy. Suddenly there's a shout and a clatter of hoofs. A spear hurtles over Arn's shoulder, and the wolf falls dead. The horse stops, and Prince Val leans down and picks up Arn in his arms and holds him tight with a look of relief on his face as he gallops home again. Last picture, little Prince Arm is home, once again safe in his mother's arms where no harm can touch him. And so ends little Prince Arm's first day roaming in the wide, wide world. He is learning that at his age, home is the safest place to be. And he's happy to know that his mother pays attention to him once again. Oh, no wonder she pays attention to him. After all, they thought he was lost, didn't they? Yeah, so did everyone. And well, it was certainly lucky that Prince Val found him before that wolf went after him. I should say so. Maybe next time, little Arn won't go wandering around without his daddy. Well, I certainly hope not, because I was scared. So was I. Now, how would you like to see what Flash Gordon is doing? Oh, I'd just love to. Because you remember last week, Flash Gordon landed on Mars and he was made a prisoner. Yes, and he was taken to meet the Queen. Menta, her name is. And she told Flash to turn over his weapons. I wonder if he will. Well, let's read now and find out what happens next in Flash's meeting with Menta, Queen of Mars. Here we go with Flash Gordon. rig a dig a doon doon Saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash has come to Mars on a mission of peace, and he tells this to Menta, Queen of Mars. She asks Val to turn over his weapons. He thinks quickly of the ray guns that they carry. Reading Flash's mind, Menta tells him she knows he carries guns. He has no choice but to obey. While Menta's guards cover him with their freeze guns, Flash tells her their mission is one of peace. The wily queen seems to accept Flash's explanation and orders a banquet for the visitors. And last picture top row, as they partake of the luscious Martian food, Menta questions Flash about the Earth's science and weapons. Suddenly, Flash notices an odd machine beside him. He picks it up and realizes it is a thought wave recorder, a machine that records every thought he has in his mind. Enraged that Flash sees through her plan to gain more information than he's willing to give, the Queen orders that the Earth people be seized as slaves. First picture bottom row, the guard steps toward him. Flash snatches a knife from Menta's belt and holds it against her, saying, One move and you die with us. Menta holds up her hand, and the guard stops. She pretends her threat was a royal whim, telling him he's much too brave to be a slave. And she tells him that they should be friends. Then, turning to an attendant, Menta tells him to see that their guests have the best quarters in the palace. As the guards stand aside to take Flash to his room, Flash turns to Dale and whispers to her, Be on guard. Flash and Dale retire. 
They go to sleep. But last picture, in the small hours of the night, a Martian slips into Flash's room and attempts to fasten a strange helmet on the sleeping Earthman's head. Once on, the helmet will bind its wearer to slavery. But at the touch of metal, Flash awakens and springs into action. I wonder, too. And I wonder whether they'll try to put that helmet on Dale. Well, I hope not, because that would make her a slave, and she'd tell Menta everything she wants to know about the Earth people's plans. Oh, this is very exciting adventure because of those strange instruments they're using. Just think, recording anything that they even think. Yes. Well, we'll find out more about this next week. Oh, now it's time for Dagwood and Bundy, and here they are on the first page of the second section. Well, since you have that all spread out, we won't waste another second. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Rama food, rama fum, zim zim zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie goes into Dagwood's office and tells him... Come, dear, quick. Over to the millinery shop and see the hat I picked out. Dagwood replies... Well, we're awfully busy. Second picture, Blondie grasps Dagwood by the arm and pulls him to the door, saying to Mr. Dithers... He'll just be gone a minute, Mr. Dithers. And Dithers replies... Well, hurry up. We gotta get these contracts finished to die. Last picture, top row, Blondie drags Dagwood into the millinery shop. The sales lady apologizes... Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bumstead, but another lady bought the hat you liked just after you left the shop. Dagwood says, first picture, next row... Too bad, dear. Well, now we've got to get right back to the office. Nonsense. We women don't give up that easily when we find a hat we like. And she pushes Dagwood into a chair. Very often, women return the hats they buy. So you wait here while I continue my shopping and tell me if she brings it back. Yeah, but, but, but I, I, I've got to get back to the office. But Blondie pays no attention to him, pushes him back, and goes out the door. Last picture, second row. Blondie sticks her head into Mr. Dither's office. Mr. Dither's, Dagwood will be at the millinery shop a while. Why don't you go over there with him and finish those contracts? Dither's answers gruffly, Well, I guess I'll have to. First picture, third row. Dagwood and Dither's are in the millinery shop, busily doing their work. When all of a sudden, a lady comes in and hands the sales lady a hat box saying... I want to return this hat. I decided I don't like it after all. Whereupon Dithers dashes out the door saying, And now we got to find Blondie and tell her. Dagwood yells, Yeah, you look in Gribble's department store, and I'll look in Snorkel's. And away they go down the street looking for Blondie. Last picture, third row, Dagwood finds Blondie in the department store. Hey, Blondie, come on back to the hat shop. The lady returned the hat you're in love with. Blondie answers. Oh, goody. And they dash back to the millinery shop. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, as Blondie tries the hat on, Dagwood says, Well, now we got to get back to the office. The hat's beautiful. Dithers adds, Yeah, it's gorgeous. And suddenly, tears come out of Blondie's eyes as she looks at herself in the mirror, and she mourns, It's not beautiful, and it's not gorgeous. And she takes the hat off. I decided I don't like it after all, and I'm not going to take it. Dithers and Dagwood collapse against each other. And last picture, they head back to the office, all worn out. And Blondie calls after them. I'll shop around some more, and when I find another hat I like, I'll come up to your office and get you. <laughs> well, now, isn't that just like a woman? Well, it may be just like a woman, but it's very funny to me. Oh, yes, it is very funny, isn't it? Yes, and that's what the funny papers are supposed to be, funny. Uh, well, we won't get into a discussion about women, then, as long as you think that this is funny. I think that's a very good idea. Uh, uh, so do I. Oh, look, here's Roy Rogers, right on East Dagwood and Blondie. Read that, please, because there's some things I want to know. Very well, I'll read that in just a minute. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And at the bottom of page one of the second section, Roy Rogers. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ayip pi -oh. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Ayip pi -oh. Norton, leader of the Cattlemen's Council, 
is convinced that a man named Blot Kramer has been rustling cattle. The consul has decided to take the law into their own hands, and they've run Blot Kramer out of town and taken over his ranch. Roy Rogers, who joined up with his friend, Deputy Jack Spratt, had been investigating to find out what Norton has against Blot Kramer. They've ridden to Blot Kramer's ranch, which is guarded by one of Norton's guards. Roy slipped up behind the guard and dropped a rope over him. Just then, a man looking like an old desert rat shot the guard and galloped away. And Norton and Carp Mallory, one of the cattlemen, ride up to find Roy and Jack Spratt with a dead guard. Jack Spratt explains to Mr. Norton, well, Somebody plugged the guard just as Roy dabbed a loop on him from above, Mr. Norton. We didn't see who fired the shot. Norton, drawing his gun, replies sternly, Trespassing on private property, plus a dead guard, adds up to murder in my book, Spratt. I'm turning you and Rogers in. Roy, who is above on the rock, begins to slide down the rope, while Norton, astride his horse beneath him, holds a gun on him. Just as Roy reaches a point where he is even with Norton, he suddenly kicks his feet out, knocking Norton off his horse onto Mallory. And before you can say Jack Spratt, Jack and Roy are galloping off, first pick to bottom row, leaving the stunned Norton and Mallory behind. Jack Spratt says, Follow me, Roy! Kramer Spratt takes up most of this canyon. I know every inch of it. Yeah, and I've got a hunch that Norton does too, Jack. It must be valuable, or else Norton wouldn't have had his cattleman's consul grab it after they ran Kramer out. Mallory helps Norton up. Are you all right, boss? Norton replies, get the horses. You've got to catch Rogers and Spratt before they find out Blood Kramer shot my guard and is prowling around here disguised as a desert rat. Jack Spratt leads Roy to a little clearing where they see a cabin. As they dismount, Jack says, third picture, bottom row. That's the south line stack of Kramer's ranch, boy. Uh, before they ran him out, it used to be well stocked with grub. Now, look, forget the food for a while, will you? Be quiet. I think I saw something move inside. They move slowly toward the cabin. Suddenly, last picture, the ground opens up beneath their feet. Hey, hey! And they fall into a pit. While inside the cabin, the old desert rat, rifle in hand, watches from behind a curtain. If that's Blot Kramer, well, that's the same man who saved Roy and Jack Spratt from the cattlemen. That's right. Well, I wonder if he'll be nice to them again. Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Wait, wait, wait. Always wait. Yes, but the waiting's always rewarded by something good, you know. And I think we'll find something good if we turn over the page. Oh, yes, indeed. Because, look, there on page three, there's Alice in Wonderland. And do you remember last week she went through the woods and came to the March Hare's garden? Yes, even though she'd been warned not to go there. And she saw a pretty little house and Japanese lanterns on the trees. I wonder what she'll find there. Well, here we go with Alice in Wonderland. Say the magic words with me. Now, now for a story, story that gets curiouser and curiouser. curiouser. Alice, Alice in Wonderland. Wonderland. So, so music, music, sir. Music, music sir. sir. Standing off in the trees, Alice sees in the March Hare's garden, under the lanterns in the trees, a table set for a banquet, and she hears the March Hare and the Mad Hatter singing. Alice slowly advances into the garden and finds the Mad Hatter and the March Hare having a mad tea party. Second picture, Alice quietly slips into a chair at the table. When the Mad Hatter and the March Hare see her, they stop singing abruptly. Alice tells them that she did enjoy their singing. At once, the Mad Hatter says, Well, 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 what a delightful child. And the March Hare exclaims, We never get compliments. <laughs> At once, it is obvious that the Mad Hatter and the March Hare are mad about Alice. Last picture top row, the Mad Hatter tells her, Well, you must have a cup of tea. And the March Hare holds a cup split in two and says, Just half a cup, please. <laughs> First picture, bottom row, as the Mad Hatter pours himself a cup of tea, Alice tells him she hopes she hasn't interrupted their birthday party. And the March Hare exclaims, Birthday party? And the Mad Hatter smiles and says, Well, my dear child, this is an unbirthday party. Alice is surprised, but patiently the Mad Hatter explains that, Maybe one has only one birthday each year, but 364 unbirthdays. And third picture, bottom row, he finishes, So... This is our unbirthday party. Whereupon Alice tells him that today is her birthday, too. Her unbirthday. The Mad Hatter leaps to his feet last picture and exclaims in surprise, It is. And the March Hare picks up a cake and holds it out to Alice, saying, 
Happy hump birthday, my dear. <laughs> and at this moment, the white rabbit rushes into the garden, ending the unbirthday party. <laughs> An unbirthday party. I would like that. So would I. Having a nice banquet every day of the year. Yes. There's only one thing, though. What? What would you do to make your birthday special? Oh, that does make it rather difficult, doesn't it? Yes, I'm afraid it does. Maybe our birthdays wouldn't be anything unusual at all. No, maybe they wouldn't. I wonder whether Alice will catch the little white rabbit next week. Well, next week we'll find out. Now it's time for Dick's Adventures. Oh, yes. Are they on the last page today? How did you guess they are? So let's turn to the very last page of the Comic Weekly. And here we are with Dick's Adventures. And do you remember that Dick was with the Yankee sailors and he'd been captured by pirates and locked up in the dungeon? Yes, and this all happened in the early days of America when the Yankees had gone to the port of Tripoli to tell the pirates they should stop plundering American ships. And uh, remember last week that Dick helped his friends to escape from the dungeon and then they dressed up in some funny kind of robes. Yes, they dressed up like Bedouins, people who live in the desert. Yes, and they're following some camels outside the city, just as though they were really people of that country. Yes. I wonder if they'll be able to fool everybody and get back to their ships without being caught again. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventure to stick. men on foot, dressed as Bedouins, move along behind the camels. The trader is puzzled to know how he's acquired so many helpers. As they near the shore, last picture top row, far out on the horizon can be, be seen the sails of the Yankee men-o'-war ships blockading the port of Tripoli. Dick worries. The problem is how to get back to them. First picture, next row. Night has already fallen when the caravan approaches a seaport. Dick looks with longing at the sleek coastal ships, and he murmurs, You know, if we could only capture one. His companions catch on quickly, and in a moment, Dick and his companions have seized the camels and have climbed down and are galloping toward the wharf. I want this ship, come on here! When the trader sees the unknown travelers galloping off with his camels and half his cargo, he yells, I thieves! Keep chase! Keep chase! Bumping and swaying like ships in a storm, they reach the water's edge just ahead of their furious pursuers. Before them lies a ship, guarded only by a sleepy watchman. Last picture, second row, they leap off the camels. Overcome the sleeping guard. They quickly cut the ropes. And first picture, bottom row, they hoist the sails. But the watchman's yells have now wakened the entire town, and Abdul, the trader, and his men are drawing closer. But Dick's last move is to stampede the camels, last picture. And he gains priceless minutes for himself, his comrades, and his country. It certainly was. I was really afraid that they were going to be caught. I thought so, too, because sometimes a ship starts so slowly. I wonder whether they'll be safe now. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now, look, here underneath Dick's adventures, oh. there's Rusty Riley. Good. I'm anxious today because this is the day that Rusty drives Snowflake in the race at the county fair. Yes, today is the day. And Mr. Crumb, the crooked owner of Grassy Acres Farm, is going to try to prevent that by hook or by crook. Mostly by crook, because he is a crook. And, and he has one of his men in the Ferris wheel with a gun to shoot Snowflake if it looks as though she's going to win the race. Yes, but don't forget that Mr. Miles and Tex have put detectives on guard. Oh, yes, and they, they went over to the Ferris wheel where the gun is hidden, and I wonder whether they, they'll be able to work out their plans before it's too late. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Top of the Ferris wheel is seat number 10. Nick, one of Mr. Crumb's hirelings, is crouched with a gun. The plan is that if it looks as though Snowflake is going to beat Poobah, Mr. Crumb's horse, Nick is to shoot Snowflake. At the post, the horses are lining up, and the two detectives hired by Mr. Miles, who has entered Snowflake in the race, are aware of the man in seat 10. One of the detectives goes up to the engineer who runs the Ferris wheel, second picture. He says to him, Say, uh, Cap, I see the wheel ain't running right now. I wonder, could you give me a hand with my car? Can't figure out what ails it. The engineer replies, Why, sure, bud. Where is it? 
The engineer walks off with the detective who says, Much obliged for your help. I'm uh, parked right over here. This is what the second detective has been waiting for. He walks over to the Ferris wheel and waits. Suddenly, there's a roar from the track. At last picture top row, the race begins. Meanwhile, in car number 10 at the top of the Ferris wheel, Nick Hunt is down. Around the bend, the horses come. First picture bottom row, Nick says to himself, Oh, here they come down the stretch. And that white mare is leading. This air gun will take care of that. Nick pulls up his gun, aims carefully at Snowflake, and is about to pull the trigger. And suddenly, the Ferris wheel jerks and starts to descend. The seat swinging back and forth, spoiling Nick's aim. Down it comes where any man holding a gun can be seen. And Nick has to drop to the bottom of his seat. A second later, third picture bottom row, Snowflake comes down the stretch and across the finish line first as Tex yells, Yippee! Boss! Rusty wins by a length! Mr. Miles, who stands behind him, says last picture. Uh, Tex, I saw the Ferris wheel start up just before the finish. Come on. Those detectives, Lewis and Jackson, must have turned up something. Tex grabs him by the arm, saying, Now hold it, hold it, boss. There goes Crumb, mad as a trap bear. Uh, keep back, and I figure we'll hear an earful. Oh, hooray, hooray, we won, we won. That's right, we won. Snowflake won the race. Yes, and I'll bet you that Mr. Crumb is going to be mad. <laughs> he certainly is, just like Tex says. And I can hardly wait until next week to hear what Mr. Crumb has to say. Well, next week we'll find out whether or not they prove Crumb's the one who caused Queenie's father to get into all of that trouble. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.